Hey, South Bay Church, we are so glad you're here today as we are wrapping up our Relationship Goals message series. In just a moment, you're going to hear from Pastor Felipe as he brings an incredible message about the subject of shame. But before we get there, I want to talk to you about two things. First of all, I want to invite you, if you don't have a life group yet, I want to invite you to an incredible life group that we have here called Alpha. Alpha really is designed for those who are new to faith or exploring faith. At this group, what we do is we take some of your biggest questions, stuff like, who is God? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? If God is so good, why do good people struggle? And we're going to wrestle through these questions in a relational format. And if you are exploring faith or you're new to following Jesus, this is the group for you. We want to help you with those questions. So sign up through the app. Uh, in fact, Stacy, my wife and I will be at that group and we're really excited about what's going to happen there. Finally, I want to make sure that you know next weekend we have a brand new teaching series that is kicking off called Win Within, Sunday, September 17th. I'm excited to talk to you about how do you succeed in life, in any endeavor, at work, at home, in your relationships. And what we'll notice through this series is that so often when it comes to success, we focus on what's on the outside, but really the win comes from within. It's like things such as overcoming our fear, uh, attitudes that affect the way that we relate to one another. All of that's on the inside. I want to encourage you to be back as we talk about how do we win within next week. Bring a friend, join us. We believe God has great things in store for this fall here at South Bay Church. Now, finally, let's turn our attention to the message that he has for us today. I want to encourage you to open your heart and please do welcome to the stage Pastor Felipe as he comes out with today's message. Well, welcome again to South Bay, all of our campuses, North Campus, South, Sunnyvale, those of you online watching your PJs, thanks for joining us. Today, we're in a series called Relationship Goals, and it's really, really important because we all have relationships we're working on, and we're kind of going to the root today of some of the brokenness we experience in relationships, and wherever you might find yourself in the journey of faith or life, I really believe there's something here for all of us, so thank you for joining us on that. You know, I want to start right away by just sharing with you my walk of shame. And you might have heard my story before if you've been here at South Bay a little while, but if you ask me what's like the top on the top of your list of, of the shame you've experienced in life, this is the story that I will tell you. Back when I was in high school, I moved from Brazil to America, from tropical country to uh, cold country in Michigan. And we, uh, I went through a cultural shock and an identity crisis. In fact, my freshman and sophomore year, connected with people in my classes and so forth in my school there that were really into drugs. And I, like many of you, got into that world uh, and, and became very dark in this world of drugs. By my sophomore year, this became a really bad part of my life and it had deepened inside of me and I was not only taking drugs, I started to sell it at my school. And what happens when you sell drugs is it goes from being something that you do to becoming more of your identity because people see you as that guy who does this. And there's something that happened in me until a uh, moment in my high school year, uh, my sophomore high school year, where the police came into my school. And I got busted at school and they brought me into the principal's office and I remember this, uh, this particular day like it was yesterday and there were two guards next to me and a dog that came to sniff my stuff and they had found drug paraphernalia and I am sitting in extreme guilt and shame uh, about what I had done. I grew up in a home that taught great values. My parents are phenomenal. They're part of our church today. They're my neighbors, and believe it or not, we get along great. And uh, so they, they, we grew up in, in a great household. I, I was taught faith, but I had deviated from those things. But I had the sense of guilt for what I had done that was overwhelming. And uh, that day, they called my dad out of work. Now, my dad was a high-level executive at Ford, and he got, you know, it's not cool to get a call from your kid's school to say your, your son was dealing drugs and you need to come out of work. And I remember sitting there in this office and just felt tremendous shame. And I just had to wait for my dad to come get me. And I had lied to them. They didn't know anything about this part of my life. And I remember walking out of the school there were about 20 steps between the school door and my car's, or my dad's car. And every step I took was just heaviness. I disappointed my family. I lied. I'm a failure. I am not who I said I was. I'm a hypocrite. 
I just I came into the car and I just had this deep sense of shame for what I had done. I'm guessing that I'm not alone, that you've had moments in your life that you felt this kind of shame. Maybe not in the same way I did, and sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes in large ways, but all of us are affected by shame. In fact, it is the primal emotion that is behind all of the brokenness of our relationships. Shame goes from, it affects us at home, it affects us at work, it affects our friendships, it affects how we view our enemies. It is the most commonly used tool to discipline kids. If you have kids, you shame them into obedience sometimes. And at the same time, it's a tool used for motivating athletes and employees and those that are under our authority. It, it's also a tool that's used uh, to, to make people do what you want them to do. It is what we attribute as the source of distance between us and those that we love, sometimes even subconsciously. We start to separate ourselves from people we love because there's something inside of us that says, hide, hide, hide. And it's what draws us closer to people who want to tell us the things we want to hear. The people that always want to tell us those things that make us feel better about ourselves, it is all fueled by shame. Shame is shaping us inside in our thoughts in our minds in our sense of identity and who we are in this world but to really effectively understand the role that it plays in our lives we have to go back to the story of human beings to the very beginning and look at how shame came into our story and where we fit into that story. So if you have the South Bay Church app, you want to open it now, go to the outline of today's message uh, or open your Bibles or it'll be on the screens as well on all of our campuses. I want to invite you to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to start in a verse in, uh, a verse in tw- chapter 1 first though, uh, but let me give you some context. Pastor Andy talked about this. If you missed it last week, go back and watch the message because it's foundational for today. But God created everything that we see. He created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. Uh, He created the darkness and the light. And then he uh, put animals in, in the sky, on earth, and under the earth. And then from the dust of the earth, he raised up Adam and breathed life into him. And from the side of Adam, from his ribs, he created the woman. Now, it's a little side tangent. I have a, a black uh, preacher friend of mine in the South, one of my favorite preachers, who was teaching on this story. And he, he said, you know, my, my black friends always try to convince me that Adam was black. He said, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Adam was not black because a black man will never give up his ribs. <laughs> so there he is, white Adam uh, and Eve. Yeah, there's a point to that. In the garden, and it's beautiful. In fact, in Genesis 128, it says that God blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all of the animals. In other words, you have freedom, you have dominion, and be fruitful and multiply. That's been God's desire for all of us from the very beginning. He put us on the earth so that we can be free, not be under dominion, but to have dominion. He put us on the earth to be fruitful, to influence, to create, to enjoy. But at the same time, there are some things in our lives that work against the very purpose of God inside of us. And then it says this in 2.25, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, the word shame is really important because it is telling us not just the story of humanity, it's telling us a story of shame, how shame came into and became the root, the foundation of so much brokenness. And for us to really understand the depth of the impact of shame, we have to see how it fits into our story and where it is in terms of the brokenness of humanity. And at this point, they had no shame. They walked around full freedom. They're naked. They're enjoying themselves. And then chapter 3. The serpent. Now, just a little note here, if you're new. Serpent was not really just a serpent. This was Satan himself, which we believe is uh, was an angel of God, and he got kicked out of the presence of God because of his defiance. And now he was condemned to eternal death, and his sole purpose is to try to hurt God and those that he loves, which is 
the people of God. And so the serpent shows up, and he's the shrewdest of all the wild animals, it says. And he asks this question to the woman. Did God really say you must not eat of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? Now, a little, a little note here, something I want you to notice. A lot of times, people that know this story think that Satan here, through the snake, asked the woman, did God really say don't eat of that one tree in the garden? which is the tree that God told them not to eat from. There's one tree, and it represented their choice to choose God or to choose their own destiny. And, and God told them, don't eat of that tree. But that's not what the snake or Satan asked the woman. If you pay attention, exactly what he said is this. Did God really say you must not eat of the, tr- of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? So there he is with the woman. He looks at all of this beauty and all of these f- different fruits and all of the, these different trees. And he asks her this question. Did God really say to you, you can't enjoy any of these fruits that are around you? And it makes you wonder why he did that. Why did he frame the question the way that he did? See, a part of it is because he's shrewd. He's got a subtle way of deceiving human beings. And unless we catch it, we become subject to the same strategy. You see, he was appealing to her pride. He asked her a question that would require her to correct him. He wanted her to feel like she was in charge, and she took the bait. And she corrected him. No, 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 no. God didn't say that. He said, we just can't eat of that one tree right there. And I bet you Satan smiled because he saw pride rise up inside of her. And he, she took a little bit of the bait. This is what he does. He deviates our attention. He wants us to focus on self and to put ourselves in charge of our destinies and redirect our attention from God. See, the things that God wants to give us, the enemy is trying to rob us of. John 10.10, Jesus said it this way, the enemy or the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you a rich and satisfying life. In other words, I came so that you can have freedom and enjoy and be, have dominion. The enemy comes to take that freedom and give, make you captive. He comes to make you not to have dominion, but to domi- be dominated. He wants us to be enslaved to sin and corruption and addictions. And where God wants us to have freedom, he wants us to have shackles. But he doesn't do it in these big, you know, whatever ways. He does it in very subtle ways usually. He twists things inside of our mind. and He's trying to disrupt the relationship that humans have with their God, with each other, and with their purpose. And pay attention to this. And then the woman corrects them. They're both deceived. They eat the fruit. They feel ashamed of themselves. And then it says, at that moment, verse 7, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves because they were afraid and naked. And in this moment, notice again the word shame. It's telling us how shame came into the story of humanity. Now, First, they were without shame. Now, they're hiding behind bushes, and they had been belittled, and their authority and dominion had shrunk, and they felt insecure, and their identity was crushed, and that's what sin does to us. And then something really strange happens. In Genesis 3.20, says, the man Adam then turned to his wife and named her Eve. See, a lot of people think that when God created Adam and Eve, he called them Adam and Eve, and it wasn't the case. In fact, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, it says that God created man and woman in his image, and he called them Adam. They had one name. Part of the reason he did this is because the name in biblical t- times had uh, described your identity. It described your purpose on the earth. And he looked at both of them and said, I want you to be free, to have dominion, to multiply, to fill the earth and be fruitful. It was one purpose, one identity, which is, which is why it's described as these two people becoming one together in marriage. It was God's design for there to be oneness in our relationships with others. But in this moment, when sin came into the earth, their covenant with God was broken. And Adam turned to his wife, and no longer one identity, now you're Eve and I'm Adam. We have two identities, 
And they have to work from that moment on to restore the oneness that they once had. See, shame separates us from God, but also from each other and from our purpose. Now they didn't feel like they had the freedom to walk around the garden and to do all the stuff that God wanted them to do. In fact, they were kicked out of all of that freedom. And now they were restricted and hiding behind bushes. And they didn't have all the ability they had to fulfill their purpose on the earth anymore in the same way. But see, this is not just a story of creation. This is our story. This is the story of all of us and how sin comes into our life and turns into guilt and then it turns into shame and it leads us to condemnation. And for a very long time, the enemy has had the same strategy. And unless we know it's a strategy, we fall under it. We fall subject to his attempts to destroy us. This is why Paul, the apostle Paul, wrote this letter to the Corinthian church and he said, Satan will not outsmart us for we are familiar with his schemes. In other words, he's got a strategy, and we have to know what it is or we fall into his strategies. And his strategy is this. He wants us to sin and to feel guilty for the sin, not deal with the guilt. Guilt can be good, but if you don't deal with it, it will wound your soul and it becomes who you are. And then instead of just guilt, now you're carrying shame, and your shame will lead you to condemnation. It's sin, guilt, shame condemnation and he wants us to go through that because he was condemned the enemy was condemned and he wants us to go through the same pattern that he went through so i want to define some of these terms for us for taking notes write some of this down see sin literally literally means to fall short romans 3 23 says we all fall short of god's glorious standard in other words, it is our inability to perform or to live at God's standard, and we all do it, every single one of us, the godliest of us and the most evil of us, we all do it. But sin is not just falling short, it makes you feel short. It diminishes us. This is why Adam and Eve, they started to hide themselves and cover themselves, because when you have sin in your life, and you felt this before, you lose your security, you, have, you get insecure. You walk around, it's hard to look people in the eye, and you're talking to your wife or your kids, and they're asking you questions related to that thing that you hid, and you, all of a sudden you can't look in, up anymore, and you don't walk with confidence, and you don't have dominion, because sin has a way of belittling who we are. That's what Satan wants to do. And then it turns into guilt. Guilt is the negative feeling based on your behavior. And we all feel it, whether you're a Christian or not, or whatever religious background you are here at South Bay, you feel guilty. When you hurt somebody, you feel guilty. When you cross the line and when your moral compass, you feel guilty. And guilt can lead you to good things. Because if you feel guilty and you do something about it, you can repair things that you broke. But see, when guilt sinks deep into your soul, which is what the enemy tries to do, he accuses you. See, that's not just what you did, that's who you are. It turns into shame. Where you feel guilt, you actually carry shame. Shame is the negative feeling based on who you think you are. I, I love uh, Brene Brown. She's a researcher, very well known in the Bay Area here, that researched uh, shame. And he's got a, she's got a great TED Talk on this. And this is a quote from her talk. It says, shame is a focus on self. Guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is, I am bad. Guilt is, I did something bad. How many of you, if you did something that was hurtful to me, would be willing to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? But you see, shame says, I'm sorry, I am a mistake. You see the difference? And we all do it. In fact, last night, I'm cooking with my daughter, Kaylin. She's uh, nine years old, and I'm frying stuff with her. And she's like right next to me, and we're just having fun together. And I'm, I drop, I went to p drop something in the boiling pan of oil and it, it, it actually dropped out of my hand before time and it splashed burning oil in her eyeball and I know some of you are going to pass out here at South Bay but she starts to scream and just like ah and I mean like out of control and and goes my mom comes and I, I'm still have like you know I'm still frying stuff so my, she's screaming for like over an hour and uh, I feel so bad, and I come into the kitchen afterwards, and I have my head down, and I told my wife, I said, I'm such a bad dad. You see what I did? You see, you can make mistakes, 
and know that it's just a mistake, or you can make a mistake and feel like you're the mistake. We all do this. It's a human tendency. It's inside of us. And the enemy always tries to take you down from sin to guilt. And it's not just guilt. You didn't just make the mistake. It's who you are. My wife turned to me and she goes, you should remember what you're teaching about tomorrow. (laughs) It's the curse of being a pastor. They can use it against you. (laughs) But you know, it's true. We have a tendency to make it be a part of our identity. But we are not our past mistakes. But shame makes you feel like you are. And then there's condemnation. See, condemnation is the sentence of our lives. It is what we are condemned to, or it is what our verdict is for our sin. And the scripture says that if we sin, and we all do, our verdict is death. We deserve death. And Satan knows that, and he wants you to feel that, and know that there's, and he wants you to think that there's no solution to sin and guilt and shame, so that you will go down the path of condemnation like he did. And condemnation is worse. It's when you take that shame and you're buried with it without ever being solved. Let me unpack shame a little bit for us. If you can follow me this way. There are different kinds of shame that we all face. There's a shame, and I want to speak to you if you're here. This is the shame of someone's mistake towards you. You were maybe a child or young, and someone wounded you so deeply that it became your identity. And that pain of someone else's mistake, though maybe even in the moment you knew it was their fault, eventually you started believing it was your fault. When that guy forced you to sleep with him, when you were subject to your parents' divorce and you saw certain pains that came in, that was not your fault. But there's a shame that Satan accuses us of, and he tries to build it in our identity. And he says, cover, cover that, because it's your fault. And God looks at us, and he says, it's not. I created you for freedom and to have dominion and to be fruitful. And God loves us the way we are, but the enemy tries to twist that in us. And if that's who you are, I want you to know this is not, it's not your fault. It's not God's intention There's another kind of shame, though. This is the shame of our mistakes. It's not what someone else did, and it might not even be a sinful behavior, but it's something that you did that you know caused so much embarrassment to you that you shoved shoved it deep into your soul, and it's reshaped the way you view yourself. And you walk around with this red covering over you because you don't want anybody to see the scars underneath or the pain that it caused, and you want to hide it, and you don't want people to know it's there, so it's just been weighing you down, and that mistake of your past has redefined your future, and your new identity is now in that mistake that you made, and God looks at you, and he says, it does not have to be so, and here's a sin and our shame. It's the stuff we do in the darkness. And you know exactly who you are when I talk about this. And you, you have this sense, this uncomfortable feeling inside of your heart because this kind of shame makes you want to really hide. It's, it's got different, different tones, by the way, of gray. And it's got different styles of coming at you. But all of this, it makes you, it makes you want to hide. It's a sin you commit in darkness and you don't want anybody to find out about you want to clear the browser and you, you want to shove it under the rug and you don't want them to run that background check because you know that if it comes, if it comes out, that they're going to know who you think you are. And you've built your identity around this covering and it weighs you down. And God looks at you and he says, I have a solution for that. You don't have to carry the weight of your sin. It's been solved. And there's another shame and this shame is unique because it's subtle and it's it's one of the most demonic shames i believe we experience is religious shame i want you to know a few things and i'm going to say this very strongly for a reason but religion is from the devil you see religion is not from god Jesus did not come to establish a new religion religious people killed jesus 
In fact, when they try to weigh people down with religion, when people of his own faith background, the Jewish people came and they tried to impose religion, you got to do this and that and that. And then he rebuked them and he says, you weigh people down with your religious demands, but you don't lift a finger to help them. Religious people hated Jesus because he came to abolish religion. See, he didn't come for Jewish people or for Christians or for or whatever religious background you might be. He came for everybody. He didn't come to start a new, better religion. He came to take care of the need of religion. And any time in the name of Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, people come to you and try to convert you to a religion, I want to tell you, run. Because Jesus is not about religion. He came to restore a loving relationship with our creator. He came to show us how to be in the garden again in freedom from the, from the, the consequences of sin, to have dominion of our lives, to conquer, to be able to be fruitful and live in an environment of grace and not religious burden. See, when we adopted our two boys, from Brazil, and you might have heard my story. We have two boys we adopted three years ago. When we brought them home, they were eight and nine years old. And one day I was talking to them about uh, prayer. We were reading a little book on prayer. and I could tell they had like a weird emotion around it. And so I, I said, hey, can, what are you feeling? And they, they said to me when, when they were in one of their foster homes, that there was one of their foster moms that used to punish them. And she would punish them by making them get on their knees on top of bottle caps or combs and recite the Lord's Prayer over and over and over again until it sunk into their knees and they would just cry. So every time they think of prayer from that moment on, they think of guilt and shame because of religion. And I want you to know if you've had that in your life, regardless of what religion it is, even Christianity, that is not from God. It is from the devil himself. Jesus comes and he wants you to remove the shame of religion and walk into relationship with him because religion never came from him. It is not his desire for us. He wants us to have freedom and grace and love and know him. And there's no need for sacrifices. He doesn't want sacrifices or rituals. God wants our heart. He wants us to be reconnected with him. And you see, I... My whole journey, even with my boys, is to help them remove religion. There's a lot of people here that you, you haven't taken a step to God because you have religion between you and God. And every time you try, you have all this shame of religious leaders that impose stuff on you and, and stuff they did to you that was shameful. And it's their shame, not yours. Jesus wants you to be free from that. But see, shame, it separates us from God, from people, from our purpose, but there's a remedy for all of this. In fact, if you go back to Genesis again, if you remember, they cover themselves with fig leaves, right? When they felt, they felt ashamed and they were covering themselves and it's their own attempt to say, I want to cover my shame. Then Genesis 3.21, listen to what God does. The Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and Eve. God looked at their man-made attempts to repair their shame, and he gave them a picture. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the solution. And through the ripping of flesh and the shedding of blood, he covered their shame. He painted a picture that someday the real solution would come from him. And one would come from God himself, and he would be God himself. And through the ripping of his flesh and the shedding of his blood, he would cover our shame once and for all. And he would declare to us that we're free again, and we don't have to cover this heaviness on us. And the guilt doesn't have to bring us down, and sin doesn't have to belittle us. We can be free to be the people he called us to be, because there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus for the Spirit of God sets us free. And that's the truth. I see, a lot of our attempts to cover shame are Band-Aids. And sometimes when we hide it, there's a pseudo sense of safety. A couple weeks ago, my, my, F, my boy Ephraim, uh, he's my seven-year-old, he came running into the house and he had blood all over his hands. And I thought, man, he's, he's like screaming. 
And I know weird stuff happens in my house, but when you have five kids, the chances are higher, right? So he's like going screaming, and there's blood everywhere. And I thought someone chopped off his hand, and it was like extreme. So he's screaming at the top of his lungs, and he's on the couch with me, and I'm trying to comfort him, and he just won't stop screaming, and there's blood everywhere. And I said, Lily, run and get a band aid. So she runs and gets a band aid, and she comes back, and he's like, ah, oh, he's screaming, and I wrap, the, wrap it around in his finger, and then he goes, ah! I was like, is it better, buddy? He goes, yeah. You see, it's funny when it's a little cut on your finger. But this is what we do with our shame. We put little band-aids, and we're like, I'm just not going to tell my wife, and I'm not going to tell God, and I'm going to pretend like it never happened. And we walk around, and we think it's all okay, and we don't know why we feel empty and why we feel incomplete, and why we feel insecure, and why we can't take feedback from people, and why at work we have all these broken relationships, and why when we try to get closer to someone, we can't get close to them, and there's something inside of us tells us, go a little bit farther, go a little bit farther, hide a little bit, don't have dominion, don't have freedom. It's because of shame, because there's a band-aid over it, and God says you need to uncover it, and if you uncover it, I will cover it with grace. But if you keep it covered, it will knock you down into condemnation. You see, animal clothing, the animal uh, clothing that God made them was symbolic of the fact that we can have our shame covered through Jesus. And it's very simple. In fact, in Romans 10, uh, 10, it says, For it is with your heart that you believe and you're justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith that you are saved. And then he says, as scriptures uh, uh, say, Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. All it takes, and if you haven't taken that step, I want to plead with you. Receive the gift of salvation. It is not you converting into a religion, just to be clear. It's you saying there is one solution for humans to reconnect with their creator, and that solution has to come from God. It cannot come from religion or human attempts to cover ourselves. It comes from God's attempt, and his attempt is Jesus. And all we need to do now is say, God, in my heart, I believe, and I profess it with my mouth that you, Jesus, you were ripped from me, and your blood was shed for me, and you conquered death by being resurrected again, and this then the sin is on him and the guilt is on him and he carries our shame all the way to condemnation so that we don't have death but have salvation it's the best gift that he's ever given to us and it's for everybody and i want to ask you to consider what would it what would you need to do today to take a step forward and say i'm, I'm going to remove all my shame and be reconnected with my creator to take that step in Colossians 2, it says, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and he shamed them publicly by his victory on them on the cross. See, the shame came back to Satan and it's off of us. But see, the second separation was us and people. And the way that we heal that separation is by uncovering our shame. And it's difficult. And I know you don't want to hear it, but the only way is to remove the Band-Aid and say, you know what? I have brokenness. And I confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed, the scripture says. There's something about uncovering our shame and letting others be a part of the healing process. We talk about this at South Bay a lot because we believe from the bottom of our hearts and it's part of scripture that freedom cannot come to our lives apart from community. This is why we do life groups at South Bay. That's why we launch 120 of them next week because we really believe that as you and I connect in small group environments, create opportunities for our lives to be connected as we grow, that freedom can be experienced. Sometimes, listen, the best gift you ever give someone you love is your vulnerability and sharing your, your weaknesses and your brokenness. It's you being willing to say, hey, I, this is my story. I'm, I'm coming clean. I want you to be a part of it. It'll hurt. It'll feel weird at first, but it'll bring great healing to your relationships. Our third separation is not just from God and from people, but from our purpose. And you might be like many people, and you're asking, what's my purpose on the earth? And this is the question that we wrestle with when our identity is broken. 
when we don't know anymore what we're created for, like Adam and Eve, you start to hide under bushes, and, and when you were created to flourish, now you are shriveled under sin and guilt and shame. And God wants to restore that. And the way you restore that, listen, is by taking all of that shame of your past and all of the sin and all the mistakes and you put it into the fuel tank of your life and you press the pedal and you use it to fuel your purpose. And the very thing the enemy tried to use to destroy you, you're going to use to bring restoration to others. It's telling your story. It's being a part of the mission on the earth. Sometimes Christians think that when they get saved, it's kind of the end of it. Like we know, I know God now. If that was the end, God would take you home the moment you commit your life to following him. The only reason you and I are still on the earth after we commit ourselves to being with Jesus or to following him and receive salvation is because he's got a mission for us. So whether you work at Google or Apple or Facebook or you're a parent or a husband or wife or you're a student, God looks at you and he says, your purpose is to take my message, the only message that solves guilt and shame and condemnation, and you take it to the world with everything that you have. I remember specifically when God told me that year, my sophomore year, after I went down the deepest hole in my life, and I remember him restoring me. And and the first time feeling peace in my life and him telling me, and now I want you to use all of your shame and your embarrassment to lift the shame off of others. And that's what he tells us. Will you be a shame lifter? Will you be a value lifter inside of people? Our world is so broken. We've seen it over the last month. There's, there's so much division and the people of God are the agents of God on the earth. Our purpose is to bring his kingdom from the earth or from, the, from heaven to the earth in a place where people are surrendered to his authority and where there's love over hatred, where there's reparation for the division the enemy wants to cause inside of us. I often wonder if Paul uh, faced this kind of reality. See, the apostle Paul, a lot of you know this, he he was one that persecuted Christians, and he would go from town to town and kill Christians and take the husband from the wife and the child from the mom, and he would rat drag them to prison. He would sometimes stone them to death until he found Jesus, and he realized he was totally wrong for what he was doing. And my wife and I this summer got to be on a sabbatical, and we traveled to some of the cities where Paul did ministry. And I stood there in locations where Paul was beat up in Corinth and in Athens and these places where he was ministering. And oftentimes in these cities, he was beat up and dragged out of the city. And the next day, he'd go, he'd go right back into the city he got beat up to tell people that God loves them, that there's a solution to their guilt and their shame. And his drive was unreal all the way to the end of his life. And then he called over, when he was an older man, now he called over all the leaders all over Turkey that he had raised up in the church. And he, he said to them, I declare to you, I have been faithful. And if anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault, for I didn't shrink back from declaring all that God has for you. In other words, I, I poured it all out on this till the very end because that is what God created us to do is to be fruitful to multiply his kingdom on the earth the most significant place I went to this summer was in Rome if you if you ever go there if you've been there you might have seen the Mamertine prison I think is how you call it is the prison where they the history records Paul and Peter spent the two last years of their lives before they Paul was beheaded and Peter was crucified upside down and it's a prison that is really dark, and I'll show you a picture on the screens, and it's a tunnel kind of feel, and it's round, and prisoners used to have, stay there underground uh, or underwater, and that's how you would suffer. And they were there for two years in this prison, and it was dark. There's no sunlight. You're underwater, so your skin starts to get all weird, and it's really strange emotion to be in there. And I'm, I'm walking there with my wife, and I'm just picturing Paul after pouring his life out and, and his full devotion to God, spending two years in this place in darkness, him and Peter together. And then I asked the historian that was with us, I said, what do we know about this place? She said, history recorded that in the waters of this jail cell, Paul and Peter baptized the two guards that were taking care of. And I just, I looked at my wife, I was like, man, 
These guys were unreal. To the very end, pouring themselves and loving those that hated them to the point where people were giving their lives to Jesus and sin and guilt and shame and condemnation being lifted from the souls of everybody around them. And that's where life comes from, is when our lives in the hands of God start to count toward the eternities of others. I want to invite you to stand with me at all of our campuses as we wrap up our time. And I can't think of a better way to finish this by, than by celebrating communion. And at all of our campuses, there are tables in the front or the back of the room where you can go to the table. And the table has two elements. It's got bread, which symbolizes the body of Jesus, the very flesh that was ripped to cover our shame. And then there's a cup that symbolizes the blood of Jesus, the blood, the blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And this is a moment for those that have committed to follow Jesus or those of you today that you're saying, this is my day. Like, I, I am ready. I'm not going to join a religion. I'm going to come to Jesus. And this is your moment to come to the table and let the elements, the bread and the, and the juice, to be your very commitment to say, Jesus, I am giving you everything in my life. My soul is yours, and I receive the solution for sin and guilt and shame and condemnation, and I want to receive salvation from those things and life eternal with you. And if you take that step today, you'll be saved. And then some of us here today, you have relationships that have been broken. And when you go to the table during this moment, this is your commitment to say, I'm going to remove my shame. I'm going to uncover it today. I'm going to let people know. I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to take steps of restoration. I'm going to be vulnerable and allow people in my life. And I'm going to join a life group. And I'm, I'm going to go to the grow track and find out what it is to find freedom. Or I'm going to go have somebody pray for me. Whatever it might be, take the step today. And there's some in the room, and I felt so compelled to talk about this, that, that you've already been a follower of Jesus, but you wonder why your heart is not fully alive. And you hear me read that verse that Jesus came to give us a rich and satisfying life. And you say, I... I know Jesus, but I don't have that rich and satisfying life. And I want you to know, your purpose now is to take everything he's done for you and you spread it with every ounce of energy you have until you're poured out empty at the end of your life so that through your life, your kids and your parents and your friends and your co-workers will find the only one that can bring hope to sin and guilt and shame and condemnation. And his name is Jesus. And it's your job now to take that message with you everywhere you go. So Father, as we come to the tables at all of our campuses, will you restore to us the confidence of our salvation? Will you restore to us, God, the separation that came because of sin? Will you flood our souls with love, God, and cover all of our sins? Will you give us grace, God, and remove the religious shame that we felt and the pain that we've experienced and the mistakes of the past, will you give us a clean slate? And I pray that every single person at the sound of my voice would receive today, God, the forgiveness that you offer, that they would come to you, Jesus, and call on your name, the only name that has the power and the authority to lift the shame of humans. And we receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.